in which our Lord Jesus passed over from death to life. The church invites her members, dispersed throughout the world, to gather in vigil and prayer. For this is the Passover of the Lord, in which, by hearing his word and celebrating his sacraments, we share in his victory over death. O oh God, through your Son you have bestowed upon your people the brightness of your light. Sanctify this new fire. And grant that in this Paschal feast we may so burn with heavenly desires that with pure minds we may attain to the festival of everlasting light. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Christ 
from the bones of death and ill, and rose victorious from the grave. How wonderful and beyond our knowing, O oh God, is your mercy and loving kindness to us, that to redeem a slave you gave a song. How holy is this night, when wickedness is put to flight, and sin is washed away. It restores innocence to the fallen, and joy to those who mourn. It casts out pride and hatred, and brings peace and concord. How blessed is this night, when earth and heaven are joined, and man is reconciled to God. Holy Father, accept our evening sacrifice, the offering of this candle in your honor. Make it shine continually to drive away all darkness. May Christ, the morning star who knows no setting, find it ever burning. He who gives light to all creation, and who lives and reigns forever. saving deeds in history, how he saved his people in ages past. And let us pray that our God will bring each of us to the fullness of redemption. Please be seated. This reading is from Genesis. In the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light, and God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let us separate the waters from the waters. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures. And let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things, and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of the earth, and every tree with seed and its fruit. You shall have them for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he made, and indeed it was very good. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude. And on the seventh day God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day and all the work that he had done.
As Pharaoh drew near, the Israelites looked back, and there were the Egyptians advancing on them. In great fear, the Israelites cried out to the Lord. But Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid, stand firm, and see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to keep still. The angel of God who was going before the Israelite army moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel. And so the cloud was there with the darkness, and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry land. The waters formed a wall for them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot fighters. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, so that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at dawn the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled before it, the, Lord's taught, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers. The entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians.
Thus says the Lord God, I will take you from the nations and gather you from all countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water upon you and I shall clean all, from all your uncleanliness and from all your idols I will cleanse you. A new heart I will give you and a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove from your body the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and make you follow my statutes and be careful to observe my ordinances. Then you shall live in the land that I gave to your ancestors and you shall be my people and I will be your God.
over Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man, dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb. Her terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Well, at the beginning of Holy Week, we talked about how this was a very traumatic time. We lived through the death of a person we love. And like the, all of his disciples, like the women who went to the tomb, we wonder, is it really true? Will we see him again? I think for us, 2,000 years or so after this event took place, it's hard for us. We know, we have this, this story in our minds. We have read the passion stories over and over this week. And we, we know how it ends. But do we know here how it ends? Or do we just hear the story in our minds? And when we see all of the traumatic, terrible events that occur in the world, do we just hear that story? Or do we feel it? And feel how true it is? That's what, that's what our question is tonight, especially at this vigil, because at the vigil we go from the death of Jesus, the darkness, the quiet, the emptiness, to he is risen. And I think it's really important for us to walk that path, traverse that space, so that we know it here, and, and not just up here. So these women, these three women that we hear about, there could well have been more, go to the tomb and they expect that they will be able to anoint Jesus' body and prepare it to be buried. This is what you do for someone who's died. And they've been waiting. Because remember, he died on the Sabbath Eve, Arab Shabbat. So they can't do anything all day Saturday. They have to sit and wait. That is very painful, isn't it? When we have to wait, we know something's happening, we have to go do something we don't want to do, but we have to do it. So they're waiting and waiting. And then they get there, and his body is gone. So I'm not surprised that their response is to run away. They are terrified um, and amazed not quite what the original language says, but it's pretty close. And they're just overwhelmed, and they run away. And as the Gospel tells us, they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. And this is where the Gospel of Mark ends. A lot of people weren't happy with that. They wanted some information about Jesus, resurrected, Jesus the Christ. And so different endings, there's a short ending and a long one that get added. But this is how Mark ended this. And that's where we are in this vigil right now. We are amazed and shocked and frightened. And we are looking for the truth of the resurrection. We're traumatized, just like these women were. And trauma is kind of how we live these days, isn't it? 
every time you turn the TV on to watch the news. I mean, I don't expect always happy stuff on the news, but boy, the things I see are, are scary. And they happen over and over again. And we don't seem to be able to face whatever the problem is that makes us keep doing this stuff over and over again. So we end up with a, a form of PTSD. We're just, we, we go numb or we run away or we just don't want to hear anything about what's going on. This, all this stuff wears on us. And I know it would not be a sermon from me without my giving you a Greek word and giving you the apology. But this one, I have to say, with great humility, um, was a surprise to me. So I looked up the word trauma, and I thought it would mean, you know, a shock, a surprise, you know, something painful, being struck or hit or whatever. Well, the root is actually a, the root that means to rub hard, like you're sanding a piece of wood, something to smooth it out, making a piece of furniture, you're really working it. It's rubbing, constantly rubbing. So in the word for trauma is this idea of repetition. It's not just once and done. That, that amazed me, because that, to me, is the nature of trauma. Something happens, and maybe something else happens, and it goes on and on. And even if it's just one thing, we play it over and over again in our minds. Don't we? We're, we're, we're just stuck with these terrible things that happen that we can't control and, and we don't want to ever have it again, and they're happening up here. And we can't live like that. We cannot live the full life that God intended us to have if we are traumatized all the time. So that's where Jesus comes in for us. By his traumatic death, he shows us that he understands what trauma is what repeated pain is, and suffering, and lack of control feels like. And he honors us for our efforts to try to live with it, to do better. And he tells us, I am with you. You're not alone through this. Feeling alone is really a hard part of trauma, of pain. If you feel that there's nobody out there who cares, why, why go on? It can be a very painful feeling. It can make whatever pain you're in much worse. This is what happened to my mother. My mother had had a, a very traumatic experience as a child. She burned herself and was disfigured. And her family's response was to feel ashamed. They felt responsible, which they sort of were. She'd gotten a hold of them. A caustic substance, and you know somebody had put it where she couldn't get to it. But they just they couldn't stand to look at her. They couldn't stand to comfort her. They couldn't stand to do anything for her. So in her own family, she was alone because they were so traumatized they couldn't help her. She was 18 months old when this happened, and she had surgery after surgery and all sorts of treatments and but never any caring. Nobody walked with her through this. And she was miserable. And by the time she finally successfully committed suicide, it was a relief for her. I'm surprised she made it as long as she did. But those years where she was alive, I have to say, were not easy for her, and they were not easy for her children. Uh, I fled from her. She was very hard to be with. And when I was with her, I just went numb. I couldn't, I couldn't talk to her. She was always drunk or on drugs and in her own misery that I couldn't help her with. And she felt alone, and she felt that God had abandoned her because her family was also very religious in a sort of formal way, but not in the way that said, Jesus is with you. And because we follow Jesus, we're with you too. Well, she was alone. She was totally alone. Jesus was alone in Gethsemane.
Gethsemane. But he was not alone in his crucifixion. There were people watching. People who loved him watching, besides all the tourists and the, who knows what, the voyeurs. There were people there with him. His mother was there watching him. And I think that he died in public for a reason. I think he chose that because he could have just gotten hit over the head with a rock somewhere, fallen off a cliff. But he did this because he wanted us to know that no matter how bad it gets, he's been there. And so he can legitimately stand with us and help us. And he can say, yes, this cross tells you that I'm with you and that there is resurrection, there's hope. You don't have to be alone. Nothing was ever hidden in the Bible, right? If you, we read the scriptures that we read in our original section, and we see everything happens out in the open. Creation is good. We're told. There's God saying, this is good. This is good. We're good. This God made us, right? This is an open statement. After Moses dies, Joshua endures the trauma of having to take over. Can you imagine having to take over from Moses? <laughs> Talk about big shoes. Um, and God says to him, I will be with you just like I was with Moses. I will not fail you or forsake you. Joshua's not by himself. After the exile occurs, God says to the Israelites, you will be my people. And I will be your God. Nobody's alone. And this is all out in the open. We just have to hear. The strength of having God with us and knowing it. Knowing in the worst, most awful moments. Like when my mother died, I said I didn't like her. I had moved to Pennsylvania, which is 3,000 miles away from where she lived in Los Angeles. But I was overwhelmed with grief. And I was surprised. I, th I thought I, I was sort of done. But it, it was terrible. So when we're in these terrible situations, and we're sort of like the broken pots that the, the psalmists talk about, we know that those terrible, that terrible pain and trauma isn't the final word. And I've said this before, the death is not the final word. Even though we know that we might experience more trauma, more pain, more misery, more sickness, more loss, the final word is Jesus. That he died and he resurrected, and he didn't do this because he had nothing else to do with his time. He did this for us, on purpose. I'm still kind of numb from my life experience, but I try so hard to know that that is true. I know it's true, and I'm working on this part. He survived. He's the worst that can happen. He's with us, and he gives himself to us because he loves us, because God created us good. God created us in his image, and Jesus is the image of God. So at the end of Mark's Gospel, which seems to end in this terrible, frightened scene of trauma, we know that those ladies who ran away from that tomb did not stay silent, right? <laughs> because how would we know otherwise? <laughs> they went out and proclaimed openly and publicly the truth that Jesus was not there because he was resurrected. It wasn't just that someone had stolen his body. And that means that we have hope. And hope can sound like a kind of vague word. We have real hope. We have the truth that Jesus is with us, that we can live like him. And our job is to proclaim this resurrection, this truth, this extravagant love of God to the whole world a world worn out by violence and trauma 
and poverty, every terrible thing. Jesus is risen. Jesus is there for us. We just have to proclaim it, call on him, and he is with us. And we, with that strength, can make the world better. Amen. Tomb. 
and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that, she had said, that he had said these things to her. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Well, we have ended Holy Week, uh, a week that actually is uh, sad, terrifying, and pushes us to the edge of our ability to trust our minds, because everything that happens is completely illogical and very difficult to make sense of. Someone dies, and that's a good thing. That's, that's the ultimate uh, illogicality. And we actually see some of this in this Gospel of John. We have Peter, who is apparently Mr. Logical, and we have Mary, who is much more heart-based. And we see their responses to coming to the tomb and finding it empty. So Mary goes to the tomb first, it's still dark, and she sees that the stone is gone. And she can tell she doesn't go in, but she can tell it's empty. The body that she was going to, I guess, anoint and bury is not there. So she runs back and tells two of the disciples, Peter and this mysterious other disciple, that uh, Jesus is not there. His body is gone. So they come running. And it's quite interesting. Uh, the, the second disciple must be a little more fit than Peter because he gets there first. Peter's lumbering along. But this second disciple, like Mary, doesn't actually go in, by the way. But Peter runs in and he barrels into the tomb and he sees that, just as Mary said, there's nobody there. Nothing's happening. So then the other disciple goes and takes a peek and looks in and he believes. He realizes not just what has happened, but what it means. But what's interesting is that at that point, because Jesus' body isn't there, they just leave. Okay, nothing to see here. Let's go home. <laughs> so they just depart. It's pretty remarkable, isn't it? <laughs> Especially the second guy who, who gets it. But Peter, Peter's been trying to figure this out. And, but he goes home, can't figure it out, so he just leaves. Okay, but Mary doesn't, doesn't leave because she's heartbroken. She's worried about Jesus. She's worried that her friend, and someone who's much more than her friend, to all of us, is gone. So I guess it was so logical that Peter and this other guy just left because what could they do? But Mary stays. And she is the one who then sees the angels who talk to her and, sorry, they don't talk to her, she talks to them. Um, and then Jesus suddenly appears. And in the course of a little conversation with Jesus, she realizes it's him. She gets it. And in fact, he has to tell her, don't hug me. I'm not in a state where you can hug me. So go. <coughs> He sends her out, the first disciple, sends her out to go tell people the good news. And she goes and says, I have seen the Lord. So the two logical guys 
don't get to see Jesus at this point. But Mary, who is here listening to God, does. So I can relate to Peter. I'm not fond of him, but I, I, I think I see in him some of my less wonderful qualities. Um, one of which is overthinking. I always feel I have to understand something. I have to research it and I have to find out the truth, whatever that might be. And sometimes the, my intuitions and my feelings, don't, I don't pay any attention to them. And that's not the best way to live. You really need to balance both. And I, I spent a lot of my life as in teaching, research, that kind of stuff. It, it never was enough for me. It never satisfied me. And I think eventually I figured out that this wasn't going to work. But as I was thinking about Easter and this illogical, crazy message that we get, that good comes out of bad, um, I, I suddenly remembered something, this really small incident in my life that had happened almost 40 years ago. And I think it was a way for Jesus to say to me, hello, Here, here's a clue, um, why don't you listen to this? And it really wasn't until this week that I realized, that, number one, I remembered this incident and that I think I got some of its message. Um, I was a graduate student, undergraduate and graduate student at UCLA. And I was in the classics department where we do Greek and Latin. And um, there were, classics professors are weird. I mean, there's just no other word for it. Um, they're, they're often very introverted people. They're, they're quite interesting. Anyway, um, so here I was. I'd been a student, and I came back from doing my further graduate work. And I was teaching there, just briefly. And uh, I was invited to a dinner with the other faculty members, which was what they did, I guess. Um, and it was at the chairman's house. So I go, and of course I'm a little nervous because these are much older people, and I'm, I'm really not, you know, I'm not a professor, I'm not this, anyway, I go to this dinner, and I don't remember very much about it. And I, it seemed to be fine, but I remember one incident. There was a, a professor who was teaching in the department whose name was Ben Lerstedt. He was Swedish, that was Lofstad. They have kind of a musical accent in Swedish. Is anyone Swedish here? <gasps> okay, well, am I right? <laughs> anyway, he was, um, he was intimidating. Um, he was old fashioned, he wasn't very old, he was in his 40s, I thought he was about 90. Um, <laughs> but he was, he was very, he was stern. And he wasn't me, but he was stern. And he knew everything. Because this, this was the tradition of European scholarship in this field and in many other fields. They, they knew all the facts. And of course, they, they did much more than that. But anyway, I had one class with him because he taught medieval Latin, which I thought was really boring. I mean, not, not the class, but I mean, just medieval Latin in general. Who cares? I quite frankly, I still feel that way. But anyway, he was a linguist, so he did a whole lot more than just you know, read the venerable bead. Um, but anyway, been in his class, and I knew that if, when he asked questions, or if someone, you know, translated a passage, and they missed something, he didn't shame them, but he made sure that we knew that that was not correct, and that he was going to teach us what was correct. So you, you tried to be sure that you were pretty correct. And like I said, he knew everything. So. Uh, and he was always, he was, I never saw him smile. Um, he just, he did his thing. He went, he got into the office at like 8 o'clock in the morning. He went home at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And I saw him, he walked to work, so he must have lived nearby. And he wore these wooden clogs. <laughs> I, I thought that was unusual. He wore wooden clogs and his, his suits, he always wore black suits that were, so worn and so old that they were kind of shiny. So he was very distinctive looking. Um, and the, 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 one of the most interesting things about him that I, I heard was that he and his wife had four children. And his wife was from Finland. So these children learned four languages. One day they spoke Finnish, one day they spoke Swedish at home, one day they spoke English, and one day they spoke German. 
So that's what they did in their home. If that is not intimidating, I don't know what it is. So I, I think you have a picture of this man. At least my picture of him at the, at the time. So anyway, back to this dinner. I'm at this dinner, and there's an old retired professor who's there. I knew who he was, and he was retired, and he was not well. And he couldn't really, he didn't have a lot of control over his, his motor skills. So I'm sitting there, and a whole bunch of us, and we're kind of you know, scattered around at these different tables. And I look over, and I see that this grumpy old uh, Swedish professor is feeding this other man. He's cut up his food, and he's also eating himself, and with complete honor and respect, and I think love, he was helping him eat, because he couldn't pick up a fork or a spoon. And he did this in a way that was not obtrusive. People weren't going, oh, I don't want to watch this. It was just natural. And I, I just kind of forgot about this. But this week, I thought about this event all these years ago, and I realized that Professor Lurstedt was actually not just an intellectual, although he was certainly a very formidable intellectual. He was a kind man. He cared about this colleague of his. He wanted him to be able to enjoy the fellowship of his, the people he'd worked with for many years, and to be able to eat. And I thought, this is a Eucharist. This is the presence of God allowing this man to live his life. Isn't that what Jesus gives us? He dies and rises so that we have life, and we celebrate that life-giving gift in the Eucharist. So I'm watching this grumpy old guy, whom I will never think of as grumpy anymore, as, as a messenger, as embodying the spirit of Christ. I have no idea what his religious practices were, but I saw there that God was present in this man and in the whole gathering. That was a real message to me. And I was allowed to see that. I think that's the reason I went to this dinner. The only one I ever went to. I, I wasn't there for a while. It was to see that. And it, it really, now, um, many years later, I kind of realized how important that is. And I think in that, I can say, as I look at that event, I can say that God wants us to notice him. Right? God is present, we aren't alone, and God is always trying to get our attention. Even in something like you know, a dinner with people who teach Greek and Latin you know, at, at UCLA. Which is, which is kind of an odd, you know, it's, it's not exactly the last supper, right? And that somebody like me can get in the way of God because I'm too busy thinking and not feeling. And when Jesus was on that cross, he was not thinking, he was feeling, right? That's our message. We need to live here as well as here. We don't want to just be totally irrational, but there's more. And the more is what Jesus has done for us. So this Easter, with all this beauty around us, beautiful mountains out there, the trees that are trying to bloom, probably they'll, they'll bloom soon, let's really sink into the knowledge that Jesus willingly died for us, for us, total strangers, so that we could know that God is with us. And that he's willing to show up anywhere, from a boring dinner to a to a homeless shelter, to anywhere, to a palace somewhere. They'll go anywhere. And let's not overthink or do anything else to get in the way of God's revealing himself to us. Isaiah tells us this beautiful piece. Our faithful God makes for us a feast of rich food and well-aged wines. He's generous. Anything that we need, God will provide. He wipes away our tears, and he swallows up death forever. There is no death. The body may die, the 
elderly professor died soon after this dinner. But he wasn't dead. He was living his life because of this friend of his. And he's living now. Let's take this gift. It's a gift. It's free. We're silly not to take it. And as we take this, as we take this gift, let us say with our hearts and our minds, we have seen the Lord. Hallelujah.